Thanks very much. I'm pleased to be here to talk about something a little bit different about the spaces between tall buildings rather than just the tall buildings. And I'm also the chair of the Urban Habitat Urban Design Committee for the CTBUH. And our, our role is to really think about tall buildings as they relate to the city. So not just the tall building in isolation, but the tall building within the city and the role of the tall building within the city. And also, quality of life issues are very important for us, right? What is it like to, to live, to work, near or in a tall building? So these are the issues that our committee is actually quite interested in. Um, in terms of the outreach of our committee, we've done a number of lectures from all around the world. We have representations, and I'll talk about the members of the panels at the end. Um, and we also publish a newsletter which we called Update, UH Update, to talk about some of the issues that are important for us. So now I'm going to pause for just a brief second because I want you to think about your favorite public space that's framed by tall building. I've asked this question now for about a year and I don't think it would surprise you to think that the majority of you say this, right? And we try to understand why and we ask that question because we actually try to understand what is it about these spaces that are so successful? How do they improve the quality of life of their development? And certainly you can see here Raymond Hood's Rockefeller Center, but the Channel Gardens, the skating rink, the program, the most famous Christmas tree in the world, uh, is something that, that gets us all excited about urbanism. So one of the things that we thought about early on as a committee and thinking about the human scale in relationship to the tower is why don't we go for a walk? Why don't we walk the urban spaces and walk the tall buildings to understand what their importance is and how tall buildings create and frame spaces. So the first walk we did was in seven cities simultaneously worldwide. We didn't do them simultaneously, but it was at 3 p.m. on January 29th, typically the coldest week in Canada, that we decided to do our first walk because we wanted to compare and understand the differences between winter and summer. Um, we started the walk in Shanghai and, uh, and then in London, New York, Ottawa, Toronto, and Chicago. So in fact, Eastern Standard Time, it was actually 3 a.m. when the Shanghai walk started to, uh, started to occur. And we live tweeted the event. And at first it was hard to get the tweets from Shanghai, so they were emailing me and then I was tweeting them, but it all worked out really well. But the idea of using social media to bring together and connect our committee members, but also so that people were not on the tour could actually follow along with something that we thought worked really well. And Vancouver, sorry, forgot to mention. This is the youngest person that actually went on these tours. I think he was about eight months old, but it actually was kind of fun. So in terms of w winter spaces, we saw some amazing images that were again broadcast on social media. The Jing'an Temple uh, in, in, in Shanghai, seen from the lobby of uh, Wheelock Square. Uh, fa fantastic galleries in London and lighting effects in London. Uh, historical and interior spaces working together in Toronto and the longest skating rink in the world at seven kilometers in Ottawa, Canada's capital. And then a restaurant lounge in Shanghai. So again, thinking about these spaces. So we started to look at the various scales to try to understand what are the significance of these spaces. So this is of course a place in Canada, we like to drink beer and we do it in all environments and all we need is a couple of fire pits and some tables and we can drink beer at the base of tall buildings. Uh, and of course, very stereotypical, the curling rink in the middle of the public plaza. But in London, Canary Wharf had a winter festival of lights. So important to think about when the leaves are barren, how can we animate these public spaces? And the winter festival actually did that extremely well. And in Toronto, I am Pays Courtyard at the, court, at the uh, Commerce Court building again, similar idea of using lighting effects to enhance public realm. Thinking about interior and exterior spaces and how they connect. Programs, of course, such as skating rinks, but also the lighting of those skating rinks and how they can influence. Microclimate, of course, very important, but public art as well, combining the two, windscreens with an art feature to actually help animate a small intimate courtyard. Thinking now larger scale, the medium spy spaces. Bryant Park was toured as part of uh, a tour here in New York that Josh Chaikin uh, of KPF organized. Uh, and then in Vancouver, Jack Pool Plaza, looking at the Olympic torch, and then also a, a number of spaces that are in, in that West Coast city. Large spaces we saw, starting in Toronto City Hall, gathering in front of the Pan Am Games countdown clock, and looking at that same space later on that day. 
In London, Canary Wharf, again, looking at the urban spaces that connect these tall buildings. And again, Cary Center in Shanghai, a variety of spaces. This project also by KPF was actually a finalist for this year's Urban Habitat Award from the CTBUH. And looking at the variety of those spaces and also the, the water features that animate those spaces. We could not have this, of course, in January in Toronto because it is too cold. Lighting in Chicago, again, looking at how that space, and think about how that space would be without the lighting and think about what that type of uh, lighting adds to the space. Public art as well, in terms of, and then also in, in, uh, in terms of uh, winter festivals like you see on the right-hand side in Ottawa. Extra large spaces we saw included, of course, Millennium Park. Uh, this was at the end of the tour, looking back down onto the park over a few drinks. Uh, and also some of the spaces and public art that you see in Millennium Park, and also skate track as well. Again, thinking about how we can enhance the quality of life of our urban centers. And then in Vancouver, this of course is January 29th in Vancouver. The grass is green and people are wearing sweaters, but that's okay, that's okay. Uh, but they also participate in our winter walk. And so some of the themes, let's tie them all together. The idea of outdoor programming is also very important. Uh, outdoor shopping, winter markets that you see. Uh, outdoor lighting and, and uh, performances like you would see, of course, at Rockefeller Center during Christmas tree lighting. Connecting these spaces. In Toronto, we actually toured or timed our walk so that we weren't outside for more than 10 minutes. And that was important because we wanted people to, to, to not freeze, first of all. But it's also important to think about how we plan these cities so that we can intersperse interior public spaces with the exterior sidewalk so that we can promote this idea of walkability in New York, looking at the new public uh, entrances to, to transit. And the winter gardens, again, is something that was very important. And uh, the Conrad Hotel, and the BCEs or Brookfield Place, sorry, Galleria in Toronto. Again, you can sit in the middle of winter and feel like you're in an outdoor cafe. So these are, of course, the other important lessons that we learned. The connections in London, I'll show you the same space when we did it in the summertime. And I'll show you this video at the end of my presentation that CTBUH staff put together combining all the tours. I want to redirect now to talk about Toronto and how we in the planning department actually create urban spaces and work with developers to do so. This is our skyline, one of the, I'd say, more dynamic ones in the world. This is our skyline in 2000, roughly about when I started to work at city planning. And this is it today. I promise that's not all my fault. But you can see the transformation that has occurred in just a short 12 years. And that, of course, has to do a lot with planning principles, making it popular to live downtown but also making it popular to, to work downtown. You know, 10 years ago, a lot of offices were moving outside the core to the lower tax base. Then they realized they could not retain the staff because the staff wanted to be and live close to a proximity where they can, where they can enjoy living and working at the same place. Um, two year old statistic now, so don't get too upset those New Yorkers in the room. New York has caught up, but we still have about 130 cranes in the air. So we're actually very dynamic. We have a lot of construction and a lot of tall building growth. How do we manage that growth? How do we improve it? Well, we think about how the tall building meets the street. Our 1 to 50 program actually secures larger scale elevation details with materials labeled so we can think about how the tall building meets the street. It's very important from a public realm perspective. And also, like you do here, we have our POPs program, privately owned, publicly accessible space. Uh, and the coat of arms that we have for the city of Toronto is indicated or represented by the alder tree that you see here that's on those plaques. So our website for our POPs actually highlights things, like you can download urban design guidelines that we wrote to talk about how to do these spaces well, and an interactive map. Uh, and which you see here. And of course, we also have plaques now so that we actually can advertise these spaces. So what are POPs, right? They're, they're spaces to engage in civic life. They're spaces to actually um, uh, retreat and relax. This was Brookfield Place four years ago. Take a look at the trees. This was it last summer. Those trees have grown a lot just in three years' time. So things like this help to contribute to the urban habitat. Uh, large urban spaces, I'm going to come back to this one. Spaces to view public art, whether they're large spaces, small spaces, 
unusual spaces that you wouldn't expect to see pieces of public art, but how the public art helps to animate these spaces. So I want to actually talk about some precedents in terms of how we create this network of urban spaces that actually connects through the downtown. This is the growth in our King Spadina area. It just gives you an idea, and this is maybe a couple of years ago. This is what's under construction. This is what's uh, uh, approved. Uh, and also this is what's approved. And I have a, an outdated version of the Mervish Gary development there, but I'm going to touch upon that later. So looking at the skyline of Toronto, here's a project uh, by Tridell, Rudy Waldman Architects, originally proposed a 60-story tower on one of our main culture corridors, our main cultural streets. Staff thought it perhaps maybe more appropriate in the staff sketch you see on the right to actually have a park at that corner rather than, a, rather than the tall building to work with a city park that's across the street. So there's the two now in plan together. Uh, and there's a rendering of that open space. Not a huge space, but a very active space. And looking down from the CN Tower, you could see how that space is with the green star. And you could see the city park across the street and how the two sort of frame and create this urban room working together. So there's a view of that, and there's a view of that park. And of course, we are the CTVUH, uh, but we also have to think not just in terms of urban habitat, with six or seven dogs per floor, moving into these buildings. We also have to think about the canine habitat of these spaces. So thinking about dog stations and, and, and uh, thinking about amenities for pets is also very important because otherwise we're not doing our job. Uh, a project uh, by, uh, two projects by KPF, the, uh, the RBC Tower on the left and the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. When positioned, these two were actually uh, between two parks. And what we wanted to do was to make sure we created these pedestrian connections, working with the development team through those spaces. So there's a view from the north. There's the view of the pedestrian connection to the north. And what we wanted to have on site. So we can, again, expand the public realm. Uh, the view of the rendering, and it's always nice when the rendering and the finished building look exactly the same, and I think that our 1 to 50 program helps with that, but you could see those walkways. And we studied them. Again, another staff sketch or staff drawing. Is it wide enough? Will it be animated? And here's the built uh, project, and the restaurant on the right-hand side just now has permission for an outdoor cafe, so next summer hopefully we'll see that help to animate the space and leading you to uh, Anish Kapoor's sculpture that you see hidden behind the trees. So there's those green arrows on the right, uh, aerial, roof, aerial view from the CN Tower. Again, thinking about how we've created this network of urban spaces. Uh, and then again, an elegant tower designed by Haruri Pontarini also has an open space. Thinking about, again, how these towers contribute to the public realm. Is heritage involved in this? And just some images. It's not a huge space, but you can see the way it's animated by the, uh, the attractive water feature designed by Janet Rosenberg and public art, how these sorts of gems of spaces, again, help enhance our quality of life. So that's the gold star that you see on top. So and then this very small precinct, you can see how we think consistently about adding to the public realm. We take it every advantage that we can. When a street jogs, we look at the geometry and how we can actually work with both sides of the street to create new, <laughs> new public art opportunities and also uh, new open spaces. Uh, separation distance is also important for us. We mandate, or try to mandate anyway, 25 meter separation distances. So you can actually see these two towers from where you're standing and looking are 25 meters apart. So that's the type of quality of life that we think we should try to achieve. Um, you can certainly see your neighbors. That's roughly the width of a right of way. But at the same time, you can see past your neighbors. So you can get access to what we call light view and privacy more open spaces in Yorkville, just north of the downtown, where we're framing heritage. And heritage, of course, is a very important thing for us. We don't have a lot of it, but here's a historic fire hall. Previously, it had a blank wall to the west, and firemen once told me that people would walk into the fire station and ask, where are the Lincolns? Because of the sign that is right next to them. That is removed, and today there's a new urban park. Looking back, you can see now the, the, uh, the clock tower forms a campanile, if you will, to that space, and there's a misting fountain in that space as well. We didn't stop there. We wanted to acknowledge and open up and think about the sites to the south the diagram that we did. This is what I call my peekaboo slide. This is the existing condition today. You can just barely see that clock tower. Sketch we did, 
and then the developer's drawing. So again, how we, again, uh, plan these urban spaces. This is a development next to the University of Toronto on Bay Street, our financial street. Originally three towers surrounding the church with a yellow stone podium building, which was six stories. We wanted to consolidate that. We said, go taller, but give us more public realm and give us more space so that this became this, an acre park on our main financial street. Think about the value of that and think about the benefits of that to, uh, to our city. Um, that park is now in design. The church is now very visible before it was hidden and becomes a focal point. So you can see here the plan by NAC Landscape Architects and the types of spaces as well. So that mature tree canopy was actually going to come down with the original proposal. And that actually is located where the Green Star is. And right next to that, we have a 1.6-acre uh, park as part of a project by Lanterra to, again, expand the public realm. And then renderings of what that park will look like. And in the railway lands, through a master plan, um, we actually can mandate a certain size for parkland. In this case, a major park, an eight-acre park, which you see here, framed by development. You can see that neighborhood now starting to emerge. And then the public art that's in that space. And then thinking again about connections through and beyond those parks. They're linked by spaces, they're linked by pops, they're linked by pedestrian networks. So a farmer's market occurring in this space is a terrific thing. As a planner, it really encourages you to see the spaces that were planned become used for things like this. We're going to walk underneath that pedestrian bridge to another neighborhood, actually. This is that pedestrian bridge, which is an amenity space for the two residential buildings. Looking south, you could see the park and the view to Lake Ontario and beyond. And of course, every pedestrian bridge needs to have a glass floor, so you can actually look straight down and look at the spaces below. Uh, that's the space below the bridge. Uh, it was, again, a POPs plaque was unveiled there. And a connecting bridge beyond that, designed by Francisco Gazzatua, a Chilean artist, to link to the neighborhood to the north. So thinking about how we link all of these spaces together, both by pedestrian networks and our 28-kilometer network of underground shopping concourse called our PATH network which again, in minus 20 degrees when it's, when it's cold in January, that is actually quite an amenity. Uh, that south entrance now to Union Station, which was created by the TELUS building, links to Maple Leaf Square. We always knew that this space, when we planned it, would be able to accommodate a couple of hundred people, like when we launched the logo for the Pan Am Games. I didn't expect this. 20,000 people gathering in that space to watch a hockey game on a big screen TV. Now, last year it didn't work out too well for us, but hopefully there's always next year. And our Raptors basketball team also gathers in that space. So again, planning and thinking about how tall buildings frame and create spaces is also important. Last project is ICE, close by, 67 and 57 stories by Architects Alliance and Lanterra, green roof, uh, right next to uh, an overhead expressway, so we had to think about that relationship to that overhead expressway and how we can actually improve upon that. There's a courtyard in the middle of that space, and you can see some views of that courtyard. So again, a simple ske staff sketch that talks about creating a linear park and an indoor connection to that path network that I talked about so that you can actually go through in a climate-controlled way like you see here as part of a CTBUH Canada tour that we held, a construction tour, or through the exterior linear park network, which you see here. And there's just some images of that open space. And this was from the top of that building in December uh, during that construction tour. And you can actually see how these tops actually engage upon the skyline and thinking about the unit that you would have to actually look at that top of that other building. Could be quite spectacular. Uh, and lastly, linking these spaces with this concept that we're planning and calling this Harbor Ring so that we have our Toronto Island, which is a park, uh, off, the, uh, off the downtown and thinking about how we can have this continuous public realm as an amenity for the downtown because right now you can only take a ferry there and thinking about how that could be linked. So that spaces like this, purposely chose this picture because of the tire, <laughs> could look like that. And something like this could look like that. Bike path, pedestrian network. 
So lead me to uh, another major undertaking now that our committee did, um, uh, which was the Warm Weather Spaces Walking Tour. We, we wanted to call it the Summer Spaces, but we had colleagues now that were in South America and, of course, uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand. So we called it the Warm Weather because it's their winter, of course. Warm Weather Spaces Walking Tour. We did this in 16 cities. We did this three weeks ago. In fact, today, if you look at the banner of the CTBH website, you will still see this as one of the top banners on the website. Uh, we did it in Auckland. Well, I'll, I'll actually run through the cities. We started in, in and Carolyn Stalker actually from, from the Brisbane Office of Architectus actually organized five of these cities to actually cont uh, go on this walk. So Melbourne City, uh, Brisbane, Shanghai, Ho Chi Minh, Singapore, Mumbai, Dubai, London, Sao Paulo, New York, Ottawa, Toronto, Chicago, Vancouver, uh, and again, some of the images that we saw, live tweeted using the hashtag CTVUH walks from Montreal, from Ho Chi Minh, the colorful streets of Ho Chi Minh City, uh, old and new architecture in Montreal, public art in London, uh, public art in Toronto, um, the, uh, the, the uh, Lake Khalifa or the, at, uh, at down, at, uh, downtown Dubai, Again, the small spaces that we saw, Shintandi District in Shanghai, you know, a wonderful district that's knitted amongst tall buildings to give a human scale to that area. Our colleagues and friends in Brisbane, of course, sorry, Melbourne, of course, focusing on their laneways. In Chicago, setting back buildings to create public plazas, and in Montreal, the same. Uh, spaces between to, uh, Bishopsgate, you saw this space in the wintertime. And then in Toronto, the sidewalk cafes that help animate the public realm. Medium spaces, again, in Ottawa, World Exchange Plaza, contributing to the, the amenity of that Class A office space. In Auckland, walking around and looking at how some of their landmarks meet the street. And I thought it was cool that they took the same picture that I took of the CN Tower in Toronto during this walk. Uh, um, parks in Montreal, in Sydney, urban plazas. In Chicago, similar urban plazas with the Picasso sculpture, large spaces that we saw. In Toronto, again, very different scene that we saw at Toronto City Hall than from the Winter Walk. In Chicago, a Lakeshore East Park. In Sao Paulo, some of the spaces that focus on, again, the heritage landmarks. And uh, in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, back to Toronto. And then the extra large spaces, again, the Brisbane tour really focused on the riverfront as an amenity for the city. And you can see spectacular views of the skyline from that tour in Dubai, walking around downtown Dubai. And they actually took a trolley ride. Uh, Mark is actually here from, uh, from Borough Hap uh, Hapold. And, uh, and uh, in Chicago, some of the Riverwalk tours. And in Mumbai, walking along the precinct of Marina Drive. And in Ottawa, along Spark Street, a pedestrian-only street, and looking back at skyline imagery from the London tour, and then in some of the interior spaces in Dubai, Montreal, uh, up at the top of, of uh, the walkie-talkie building, looking at the spectacular views that we encountered from that tour of the Shard and the Thames, and in Vancouver, looking at the spaces that will be developed on the upper right and walking around the Olympic Village. So lastly, I'm just going to talk about a publication that we're all working on that will be published this time next year at the uh, conference, Urban Spaces Surrounding Tall Buildings. Uh, here, is the, here is the committee members as it is today. Myself, Richard Wilson from Chicago, Richard Witt from Toronto, Josh Chaikin from New York, uh, Randolph Wang from Ottawa, Dominic Pettison from London, uh, Vinder David from Mumbai, Tom Ford from Shanghai, Andrew David Hassam from Singapore, Mark Lavery from Dubai, Carolyn Stalker from Brisbane, and Holly Softy from Vancouver. So this group has actually been working together for mostly a year. We haven't really even met each other. We've been working by email communication, but we're going to cover the range of, of, of spaces, including small, medium, and large that I talked about today. And I'm just going to close with, again, a one-minute video just to show you, this is something that CTBH staff put together of the winter walk. Mm -hmm. 